Most of us use practice problems to help students build these long-term memories, right? Here's a series of 10 problems, go practice those, and that's going to help you kind of form these schema. The problem is, though, if students are kind of new to a topic, those practice problems might be too much. They might not have enough stored yet to really make sense of what's coming at them, so those problems just become overwhelming. There's too much for them. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called A Meta-Analysis of the Worked Examples Effect on Mathematics Performance by Barbieri and colleagues. Now to understand this paper, there are two principles of memory we have to wrap our head around. The first is this. There is a limit to the amount of information you can take into conscious awareness at any one moment. So to see what I'm talking about, here is a series of letters. Can you quickly and easily memorize all these letters? Or are there just a few too many? I'm guessing you're struggling. Why? Because there's a limit to the amount of information we can take in. But if this is the case, then how do we get any thinking done? Well, the second principle of memory is this. Knowledge and automation trump that limit. So this means anytime we have information locked down and organized in our long-term memory, we can use that information to support to bolster this limit. So to see what I mean, let's go back to those letters. Now watch what happens if I simply rearrange the spacing. Can you quickly and easily memorize all these now? Now I'm guessing you're doing fine. Why? Because knowledge and automation trump the limit. We've gone from input information coming into our awareness to output. We're using our long-term memory, things we already know, to support bolster that limit. Now we've got plenty of space to think about other stuff. Now why does this matter? Most of us use practice problems to help students build these long-term memories, right? Here's a series of 10 problems, go practice those, and that's going to help you kind of form these schema. The problem is, though, if students are kind of new to a topic, those practice problems might be too much. They might not have enough stored yet to really make sense of what's coming at them, so those problems just become overwhelming. There's too much for them. Enter now the worked examples effect. This says if you replace some or all of those practice problems with worked examples, a demonstration of how that problem should be done, then students can start to study that worked example and use that to build these long-term memories, which will support them to undertake future practice problems. Now, believe it or not, there are thousands of studies over the last two decades demonstrating that worked examples boost learning speed and accuracy. So this is a powerful tool. As a simple example, give one group of students 10 practice problems for homework, give another group five practice problems with five worked examples interspaced. Now, after doing this homework, which of these groups do you think performs better on a future test? Turns out it's the worked examples group by up to 40%. Even though they did only half the practice, they got nearly a 50% boost in their future performance. Why? Because the worked examples helped them build those long-term memories, which helped support them as they had to solve problems in the future. So we know worked examples are effective in a laboratory. The vast majority of research, unfortunately, has been done in a lab, a psychology setting. That's where this paper comes in. These researchers found 55 studies that took place in real classrooms, real math classes, and they meta-analyzed those to see does this work in the real world and what are kind of the boundary conditions? When does it work best? When does it not really work? And here's what they found. Compared to students who only undertake practice problems, including worked examples has a 0.48 effect size on learning outcomes. Now that's pretty significant and powerful. So that shows that even in the real world, worked examples are an effective teaching learning mechanism. But what are some of the boundary conditions? Next, these researchers compared correct examples versus incorrect examples. So is it more powerful if you see worked examples that are all correct, or if you see a couple of incorrect worked examples, things you shouldn't do when trying to solve a problem? When they analyzed these, what they found was all correct worked examples has an effect size of 0.72, while interspersed correct and incorrect has an effect size of only 0.22. So when we're using worked examples to help students build these long-term memories, it's important we use correct examples. The more we bring in confusing, incorrect examples, although the theory is that might help them better differentiate good and bad strategies, what it's really doing is it seems to be confusing them. So correct is better than incorrect or mixed. And finally, they took a look at including self-explanations. So some worked examples also have prompts that say, why do you think this worked? Explain what process is going on here. Can you put these steps into your own words? They add an element of explanation so that presumably students can home in and focus on what's really important in that worked example. Now, does this work? It turns out when you include self-explanation prompts to work examples, the effect size drops to 0.24. And when you take away those prompts, you simply show the worked examples, the effect size jumps to 0.72. 
So again, we get this issue that when students are new to learning something, the more information we try and shove at them at once, it's harder and takes more time for them to form long-term memories. But if all we do is focus on the correct, the effective method in our worked examples, this leads to enhanced long-term memory, which in turn supports future problem solving. So now then, let's bring this back to us. What does this all mean for us as teachers? Well, I can think of three very important things. And the first is this. Oftentimes we focus on heavy practice-based homework, which is really effective. When homework is based on practicing, on locking down skills we already have, we're just trying to automate them, it's a very powerful tool. But here we see sometimes students don't have enough long-term memory, enough prior knowledge to effectively build these skills. In which case we can bring in worked examples into our homework, intersperse worked examples with practice problems to ensure they're locking down the right information in a speedier fashion. And this brings us to idea number two, which is something that Ollie Lovell, an educator in Australia says, he says, normally we focus on this kind of, I do, we do, you do model. I do, I'm gonna teach you something, we do, maybe we do one or two worked examples on the board together, then you do, go do some practice problems, show me what you got. And Ollie makes a good point. If you haven't built these long-term memories, automated these skills, then the you do might be kind of pointless. You might not have enough knowledge or ability to do anything effectively. So he suggests maybe we should change the proportions of these. Maybe a little less I do, a whole lot more we do, and a little less you do. In this long we do, these are where we're putting in the worked examples. We're spending a lot more time working with students, helping support them as they build these long-term memories. And only when we know they've got them locked down do we say, okay, your turn. Now show me what you got. Do some practice or performance problems and use your new knowledge and automation to support your thinking while doing it. And this brings us to idea number three, learning is a long process. Remember a couple videos ago, we saw learning isn't a thing, it's a long trajectory. We got surface learning, three levels of deep learning, transfer learning. And sometimes we think once is enough. If I've taught it to you well, you should be able to do it. And here we see no, students are still going to need a lot of practice. And with that practice, they're still going to need a lot of support in order to move effectively through that trajectory. Which brings us back to those two kind of key findings at the end of this paper here, where they said wrong or false examples are no good and self-explanations are no good. Well, it turns out we've got a lot of research in laboratories showing those can actually boost performance, but they only boost performance later in the game when students are around deep two or deep three. So it's not that the idea of introducing wrong examples or having students demonstrate metacognition by explaining their thinking is bad. It's simply not effective at the earlier stages when they don't have enough knowledge or long-term memories to meaningfully explain what it was they were doing. As they move deeper and really start to lock these things down, that's when we can bring in false examples and say, hey, why is this wrong? That's when we can bring in metacognition and say, make a prediction, what do you think is gonna happen next? Too often we try and rush people through the learning trajectory. And here this worked example effect just demonstrates time, support, structure. This is how we move and reach those outcomes we really hope to see. Things like creative invention and critical thinking. We cannot start there. Those things emerge through this process of learning and there are great strategies and tools we can use to support movement through that trajectory. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you got something good. If you like what you saw, if you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below, it'll make sure more people get a chance to see this on YouTube. Otherwise, thanks so much. I'll see you all the next one.